maybe you're like me and you had to use the other belt loop after Thanksgiving. I hope not, but that's okay. We're here to worship. Let's all stand together. You notice some Christmas decorations. We've got Christmas hymns this morning. Tis the season. Come all ye faithful. Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. Christ the Lord. Sing choirs of angels. Sing in exultation. Oh, sing all ye bright hosts of heaven above. Glory to God, all glory in the highest. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. Hey, Lord, we greet Thee for this happy morning. Jesus, to Thee be all glory given. Word of the Father, now in flesh appearing, oh, come, let us adore Him, oh, come, let us adore Him, oh, come, let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. Amen. I hope that's why you're here this morning, to adore Him, Christ our Lord. Thank you for being here this morning. You may be seated. It is raining outside, but it's a beautiful day today. You know why, right? That's right. My, you see my tie here? Michigan won yesterday in the big game. And so that makes me a happy guy today, so Avery doesn't have to worry about me being in a bad mood, so it's all good, so uh, we had a great day yesterday. So I hope you had a good day yesterday, too. I heard Carolina didn't have such a great uh, week. <clears throat> Lisa told me that coming in. I didn't know. <laughs> but uh, uh, what would we do without sports around? This is, a, this is a good week. I enjoy this time of year. Um, most of the time, not always. Some announcements just to uh, bring to your attention. If you have a bulletin, uh, make sure you look at the bulletin. There's a lot of things in here. I'm not going to go over every single thing. But this Wednesday, our executive board will be having a meeting after the, uh, after the evening service uh, Wednesday night. So executive board members, uh, please remember that. Also on Thursday... Um, our senior saints will be traveling to Smithville to the Outlet Mall. So if you would like to go and, and go with us, go shopping, uh, please be here uh, Thursday morning. We'll be leaving at 9 o'clock, return around 5 in the afternoon uh, for that as well. Uh, next Sunday night, uh, I, was, I, I, I knew this was coming and I read it this morning and it still kind of seems like it's just early. But uh, next Sunday night, our Joyful Noise uh, children's group will be doing... Uh, the Christmas program over in the Family Life Center. Uh, we always enjoy that every year, um, but that is next Sunday night, so please come. Invite someone to come with you. Uh, we're looking forward to, um, uh, to that as well. December the 14th, we'll be having our quarterly business meeting. That is a Wednesday night after our, our, after our service. We'll be having that business meeting, uh, so please be here for that if you can. And then December the 24th, we'll be having a Christmas Eve communion service 
Uh, we're looking forward to having that service. Um, this will be the first time that I've been here in 15 years for Christmas. And I'm looking forward to it, looking forward to having this Christmas Eve uh, communion service. We'll have music and communion together. Uh, so please come if you can, be a part of that. Uh, if you have family visiting with you, bring them along. We'd love to have them come and be a part of that with us on that night. Also today, um, we're starting our Christmas, our church Christmas cards fundraiser that the teenagers are doing. Uh, there is a red box, if you notice that coming in this morning out in the Welcome Center. Uh, if you have cards for our church family here, uh, you can drop those off there, 25 cents a card. Uh, the teens, Brother Daniel, the teens will be delivering those uh, in the next few weeks. And so please uh, drop those off for them. That is a good fundraiser for them. And then also... Um, it's not in the bulletin, the paper's not in the bulletin this week, but the papers are on the Welcome Center desk. If you'd like to uh, purchase a poinsettia in memory or in honor of, uh, there's a paper that you can get that's on the Welcome Center ta desk out there, and you can fill that out. Uh, normally, turn that into Miss Tracy. If you have one to turn in today, uh, turn that into Miss Tammy. Uh, Miss Tracy is not able to be here this morning, so please uh, give that to Miss Tammy Lewis up here, and she'll take care of that for us. But um, uh, you can do that in memory or honor of, uh, of your loved one. Um, we have a couple prayer requests just to bring to your attention this morning. Uh, remember Mr. Linwood Ambrose, he's in the hospital uh, going through uh, some treatments, so please pray for him and his family as he's going through this. Uh, please remember Bobby Hollis, he is uh, having knee surgery tomorrow, uh, so please keep him in your prayers. This is something that has been postponed and been waiting for, and it's finally the day is coming, so pray that nothing interferes or stops this surgery from happening tomorrow uh, for him. Also, um, Miss Betty Lou Ingalls um, texted me and said that she would not be here today. Uh, she fell this week um, cooking at her house, and uh, she's kind of bruised up and not able to, to uh, get comfortable sitting and, and things, and so she's just not able to be here this morning. Uh, and then also Dennis Hawkins' sister, Miss Betty Main, uh, she fell this week, broke a hip, and so remember her in your prayers. Dennis pointed out uh, that she is his older sister. Um, so we just remember that and remember her in your prayer as well. Let's pray. We'll ask God to be in our service this morning. God, thank you so much for who you are, for what you do for us, Lord. We thank you for loving us. God, we thank you for this Christmas season, the time where we can remember uh, what you've done for us and who you are, that you came uh, to this world to seek and to save the lost. So God, I pray that you will uh, be glorified in, in our service today. Lord, be with the uh, these prayer requests that we mentioned this morning, Lord, I pray that you be with the Ambrose family, Mr. Linwood, uh, as he's in the hospital right now, Lord, I pray that you'll be with him. God, for Mr. Bobby Hollis, as he has surgery tomorrow, Lord, I pray things will go well uh, with that and you'll uh, be able to relieve him of some pain that he is going through. God, for Miss Betty Main, Dennis's sister, Lord, who broke her hip, we pray that you'll be with her um, as she is uh, uh, trying to recover from that now, Lord. For Miss Betty Lou Ingalls, Lord, as she is uh, just recovering from the fall, that, the fall that she took, Lord, I pray that you will uh, give her some strength as well. God, pray for those who um, we pray for those who are sick this morning, Lord. They're not able to be here, Lord. We have some that had the flu that's not feeling well, and so God, I pray that you'll touch them, give them healing. So God, we thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for your love. We thank you for our church. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.
our God was born to save us. Jesus was born to save us, and that implies that we need saving. This is the news that we need to tell. The world, and sometimes we even are tempted to think as we celebrate Jesus in the manger, that he stayed in the manger, and he is this, you know, sweet child born of a virgin, all that stuff, came and told us that you're good and all that stuff, and, and then we forget about him, but his destiny whenever he came was the cross, and the cross is there because of your sin and mine. But praise the Lord, through all of it, he saved us, and this is the news that we have to tell, and that's why we sing, go tell it, on the mountain, by the river, everywhere, that Jesus Christ is born to save us. Let's all stand and sing this song together, go tell it on the mountain. Kings and nations 
not just because you're some cute baby in a manger with a sweet story around it, but because you are love incarnate. You love me enough to look past all my sin and my selfishness. You saw exactly what I was and you still loved me enough to come and to live for 33 years in perfection, experiencing the world and all of its temptation and all of its trials that I experience and think too often that it's too much. Lord, you took it all and you bore my burden purely, 100%. And you never faltered once so that you could be the spotless lamb to die in my place for my sin so that I could have life eternal, so that I could have your righteousness and the sweet innocence and preciousness of the baby in the manger. You give us that same kind of purity through the blood of your son. And Lord, we accept you gratefully and ask you to have your will and your way in us right now. Whatever your word has to bring to us, God, I pray that you would make our hearts to be receptive to it so that we can take it, receive it, and live it out in a world that needs you so much. Lord, give us courage to go and tell it, to shout it on the mountain and everywhere that you are born to take away the sins of the world. We love you, and we give you this time for however you seek to use it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for worshiping, everyone. I pray that it was a blessing to your heart. You may be seated first through sixth graders. Y'all can go ahead and be dismissed to jam time as well. If you have a Bible, if you want to look at Isaiah chapter 7, we're going to be there um, in just a minute. Uh, I wanted to uh, <laughs> I want to share with you, I got a lot of texts yesterday considering my football team was playing in the biggest game of the year, but this was my favorite by far. I'm not going to mention names to incriminate anyone. It says, my wife is mad at you. She could be watching a Hallmark movie, but no, she's watching the Michigan game because her pastor is a Michigan fan. So I thought that was pretty good. Michigan football game was beating out the Hallmark movie. That was good. Every time that happens, that's a good thing. Um, I want to look at the season of miracles. I want to look at some miracles uh, that we can see from this Christmas time. Thanksgiving has now come and gone, and now we're entering into the Christmas festivities. And I, on purpose, I don't listen to Christmas music or put up my Christmas tree until Friday after uh, Thanksgiving. I know some people, as soon as Halloween's over, some people start before Halloween, but as soon as Halloween's over, they'll start doing it. But I don't do it until the Friday after. Um, but now we get into these Christmas festivities, and we, we go... Uh, with that, but needless to say, as we get into this, the culture in which we live many times makes it difficult uh, for us to focus on the true reason of this season, uh, to focus on Jesus, to focus on uh, Jesus coming down, God sending his son to the earth. And many times we, we lose that focus because of all the things that are happening, because of everything that's going on around us. Sometimes it's our own fault. Why do we make it harder on ourselves than it really has to be? Many times, I think, our expectations of ourself is too grand. We expect more out of ourselves than what we give. And what that means is we're expecting to maintain the same high levels of celebration for the season, the high levels of people-pleasing sometimes self-pleasing, uh, maintain the high levels of just doing the same things that we've done in years past. And so we want to make sure we're doing it, we're doing it big, we're doing it all together. We have all these things that are going on while simultaneously we're trying to make Jesus the center of our attention. So we have all of these other things that we're trying to put together, trying to maintain. We've got to have this big family thing. We gotta, oh, we've got to make sure we have all the presents. We've got to make sure we have everything decorated. We have to make sure, oh, we have all these parties going on. We have this going on. We have this happening. And while we're trying to put all those things together, 
We're also trying to remember, oh, yeah, but we have to put Jesus first, even though we're doing all these other things. And so somehow what happens here is Jesus always seems to fall through the cracks uh, when our focus becomes maintaining every festive food tradition that we've ever had, every gift-giving expectations that we're supposed to live up to, we start remembering those and pushing those and focusing on those and get so busy with those that we forget about the focus that it should be on Jesus. Many times, our shopping takes precedence over being still and knowing that he is God. Many times, our purchases take precedence over our prayer time. Many times, our gluttony takes precedence over our giving. Maybe it's just me, but it seems like something here has got to give. Something needs to give in these expectations of what's going to happen. Either that or our perspectives need to be shifted a little bit and changed a little bit. When I was a child, some of you guys may have uh, experienced some of these things as well, but when I was a child, if we had a Christmas Eve service or if we had a Christmas Day Sunday service, you know, it, it always felt like we had to be there out of obligation. It wasn't that we needed to be. This is, I mean, the whole reason why we celebrate Christmas is because of Jesus. But yet when Christmas falls on Sunday, it's like, ah, oh, we got to go to church on Sunday. It's Christmas. Oh, I can't believe they're doing Christmas Eve service. Oh, man, we have, this is terrible. This is just, man, there's just so much. You know, I always enjoyed those services for the most part. But I, it, it, it often felt like it was something that I had to do or something that I was being made to do to go to those things. It was like a box on my list of things I needed to do to get checked off. Went to the Christmas Eve service, check. It's just so we could say that we were there, that we were part of it. Have you ever, on Christmas morning, have you ever just, before you opened the presents, before everything got started, did you ever have everybody, just, okay, everybody just sit down, and we're going to read the Christmas story from Luke chapter 2. And so you have everybody sit down and you're trying to do this. And while they're reading the Christmas story from Luke chapter 2, seems like all you could do is focus on that stuffed animal that's poking out of the stocking over there. Oh, yeah, we're hearing about Jesus. You know, Caesar Augustus all went to be taxed, everyone to his own city, all this stuff, and the angels here and the shepherds here and all these things going on. And there's something in that box I know. I really need to get that box. I really need to. We don't focus on what's being read, the Christmas story, why we're actually here to celebrate. We're focusing on what's in that box, what's in that stocking hanging up on the mantle. We get so excited about those things that we forget about listening. One of the precious things that we should gain from little children is a sense of childlike wonder. We should have childlike wonder. The kind that comes with, you know, the first time it snows, and you sit there, everybody's, I mean, you, it, you may be the exact opposite, but a lot of people go out there and they see it and they're going, oh, no, I won't be able to get home from work. I won't be able to go to work. Uh, but sometimes you just go there and you look and you see it coming down, and you're just like, wow, this is beautiful. And you just look at it, and you're so amazed. You're so excited about the snow coming down. Maybe it's the crackling of a maybe not so often lit fireplace. Don't you just love that sound? When you have the fireplace there, and you sit back, and you can just watch the fire. I don't know what it is. There's nothing in the fire except for wood and fire. But it's something that you just sit there and watch and look at. It's just so neat and amazing to watch those things. With the excitement, the anticipation of a neatly wrapped box, little children get so excited about that box that's there. And it's not because of material lust for what's inside of it necessarily. 
Many times this excitement and this anticipation is because they're receiving something that they couldn't get themselves. Someone got it for me. And they're so excited because it's there. See, sometimes we need a little bit of this excitement about Christmas, this excitement about Jesus, who he is, what he has done for this, for us. In relation to the gift of Christmas, God incarnate, Emmanuel, we have to understand that there is nothing that humankind, us, could have done, could ever do or ever deserve to receive such a gift. There's nothing that we've done to deserve Jesus coming to earth for us. Salvation that he has brought. You see, this baby that was born on Christmas, God made flesh. He came, the Bible tells us, he came to seek and to save the lost. To bring hope to a destitute and dying world. Jesus came to give us hope, the excitement, the joy that we should have. A lot of times Christmas is the time when we are not having much joy. We're not having such hope and excitement. There's so much to do. We have to go do this, and we have to do this, and we have to do these things. We have to go to this place. I have to spend money here. I don't know where I'm going to come up with the money to buy this gift. Oh, my goodness, I have to buy this gift now. And so we focus on all of those things instead of focusing on Jesus bringing us hope. Jesus bringing us joy. So my question is, how do we reclaim the wonder of this Christmas season? Perhaps what we need to do is return, and this is where I'm going with this this morning, is return to the the miracles of Christmas. The miracles that Christmas brought us. As we enter the season of miracles, there's the the, the miracle of the virgin mother. There's the miracle of the manger, the angels that came, the messengers that were there with them. There's the miracle of the magi, the wise men who came in. There's these miracles that happened here. And each one of these miracles, I believe, teach us something about God. And I believe that we can correctly conclude that each of these miracles are also messages of Christmas. And so what I'd like to do today is I'd like to look at the miracle of the Virgin Mother. This miracle is a message to us full of promises, full of solutions, and full of peace. And so I want to look at that this morning. In our, our, our text, our main passage is Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And that, that verse says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. So we have to look at that And remember and take into account, what is this verse really saying to us? You know, we hear it sometimes, but when we think of Christmas, we always think of Matthew 1 and Luke chapter 2. But there's a lot of stuff that's just packed in just in this little verse. The first thing I want you to see is God is the great promise maker. God is the great promise maker. And, and, And to see this, we're going to have to go back a little ways. After God created the world, yes, we're going back to Genesis here. After God created the world, Satan came in and he ushered in the fall of man and sin and separation from God became known. We were now separated from God. Our sin separated us from the creator of the world. And if you stopped there, everything seemed like it uh, all is lost. Man, this is just horrible. This is just terrible. We should just get an eraser and erase the whole thing. It's bad. But then, as God declares what the consequences of the fall would be, we see that. You're going to have to sweat and work and do this and, and, and pain and childbirth and all these things are coming in here. He says all these things are happening here. But as he's declaring the consequences of the fall... Among the gloom of this curse that's there, we find a little ray of sunshine right in the middle of this. It only takes up one verse, 
but it's there. A little bit of light to focus on a very dark tunnel. Sin is here, but there's light. There's hope. Speaking to the serpent, God said in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, I was looking at this, and I looked at some different commentaries about this. William McDonald, in the Believer's Bible Commentary, he wrote this. This verse is known as the protevangelum, meaning the first gospel. It predicts the perpetual hostility between Satan and the woman who represented all mankind, and between Satan's seed, his agents, and her seed, the Messiah, The woman's seed would crush the devil's head, a mortal wound spelling utter defeat for him. This wound was administrated at Calvary when the Savior decisively triumphed over the devil. Satan, in turn, would bruise the Messiah's heel. The heel wound here speaks of suffering and even of physical death, but not of ultimate defeat. So Christ suffered on the cross. And even died, but he rose from the dead victorious over sin, hell, and over Satan. The fact that he is called the woman's seed may contain a suggestion of his virgin birth. So what he is, he is saying here, uh, William McDonald is saying here, is that, listen, he would crush his head. Jesus is going to crush death. He's going to crush sin. He's going to crush Satan. Satan's going to bruise him. He's, you know, Jesus is going to have bruises. He's going to be beaten. He's going to die on the cross. But, you know, I was thinking about this bruise. You ever had a bruise? Bruises can be tough. They can be bad. You get one in the wrong spot on your arm or on your leg or your knee. Something that happens there, you have this bruise. Sometimes it can get ugly and blue and black and all nasty looking. And sometimes it hurts just to kneel down. Sometimes if somebody just comes up and says, hey, how you doing? You're like, oh, you feel like you just. But here's the thing about a bruise, right? A bruise heals. A bruise goes away. You see, Satan was going to bruise his heel. Jesus is going to crush his head, but Satan's just going to bruise him. And the bruise goes away. Jesus came back to life. Jesus defeated these things when he died on the cross and then rose again later. So we see, the, we see also from this verse here that we have a promise, the first promise that we read in Scripture of a Savior. The details in this verse are not clearly established on the who, the when, and the how of who this is going to be. But yet there is a promise of someone, the seed of a woman, who would crush the serpent's head. We have the promise of a Savior that's going to come and save us. Arnold Fruchtenbahn, a German man, he was another commentator. He said this, The seed of the woman is the Messiah himself, making this the first Messiah prophecy in the Bible. To refer to the Messiah as the seed of a woman goes contrary to the biblical norm, since in Scripture the seed is always traced after the male line. The genealogies throughout the Bible, including those in Genesis, always give the male line. However, with the Messiah, things are going to be different. And then only centuries later in Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14, it is made clear that the Messiah will be conceived in the womb of a virgin. Yet from the beginning of the seed, the woman is implied to be, it would be a supernatural conception. That things would be different with this. God's promise of redemption through the virgin birth of Christ showed God's love for mankind and that he would provide a savior for sinners. And we see these things coming from Isaiah chapter 7, but we also can go all the way back to Genesis and see the promise that God made for us. He said, I will provide someone, the seed of a woman. And then we see in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, a virgin woman is going to conceive, and we're going to call his name Emmanuel. We're getting more 
as we go along through the Bible of who this is going to mean. And what this means is that God's grace would bring salvation to those of us, which is all of us, who don't deserve salvation. The free gift of salvation that was promised in Genesis, that was talked about in Isaiah, was given to us when Jesus died on the cross in the New Testament. And then with the return of Jesus in Revelation, we see that, hey, listen, salvation to all those who believe is coming one day. You see, the Bible, the Bible from cover to cover is full of salvation. Salvation that we need, even though we don't deserve it. Isaiah 7.14 again says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. The virgin birth that is announced here in Isaiah would announce to the world at that time the coming of the Redeemer. The Redeemer's coming. Now, in my Sunday school lesson this morning, we were talking about problems that, that these people were having. You, you reap what you sow is kind of what our title was. And these things that were happening and what was going on, consequences of, of not following God, blessings of following God, all these things that happen. But a lot of these things that happened in Second Kings, that we were, our text that we were reading in Sunday school, happened because people were sinning and they're not following God. They were not doing They needed someone to come and redeem them. Their, their city, Jerusalem, had been destroyed. The walls had been torn down. The temple had been destroyed. All of these things that were going on here were happening because of sin. They needed a redeemer. And here comes Isaiah. Isaiah says, listen, Emmanuel is coming. A redeemer is coming to save all of us from our sins. God made that promise in Genesis. And it was now fulfilled on Christmas Day. The promise that God made for us. You see, God is the great promise maker. But we also have to see the second thing I want you to see is God is the great problem solver. Any of you guys in here ever have a problem? I mean, Randy and me, you know, we have problems. Some of you guys, kind of like me as well, kind of like to be the Try to solve all the problems, fix it, Mr. Fix It. You try to fix these things. Sometimes you don't know how to fix it, but you, I'm going to fix it, and you just make it worse sometimes. But you're wanting to fix it. You're wanting to, I mean, why? Because there's problems, right? And we all have problems. Some problems are big, some problems are little, but all problems that you have are big, right? We all have problems. Well, God is a great problem solver. You see, the promise that God made in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, called for a Savior that was going to come to the world, redeem mankind, and restore the separation that sin had caused. That's a big problem. Sin causes separation from God. We need, a, we need to fix this problem. So God's going to solve this. What do we see? This Savior was to be born of a... Virgin, the Savior that's going to come and fix these problems is going to be born of a virgin. Again, our text, Isaiah 7, 14, I'm reading this a third time because I want you to understand what this verse is saying here. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign, and behold, the virgin will conceive. She's going to bear a son. You're going to call his name Emmanuel because he's going to solve these problems that you're having with the separation between God and man. He's coming. He's going to fix these things. But when we see this again, being born of a virgin was just a promise or a problem all in itself. I mean, that's not how things usually work. There's a problem here. Isaiah is saying, she's going to be born of a virgin. Everybody's saying, nah, there's a problem there. This doesn't happen. But I want you to consider the creation, again, going back, the creation of Adam and Eve. Now, when I look at this, I, I didn't put all the whole, there, there could be a lot of scriptures that you could read with this. I just had two verses, one for Adam, one for Eve. And I want you to look at these things. In, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, Then the Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. God formed man out of the dust on the ground. And I always like to, you know, you, he, 
when he made the animals, give me a zebra, boom, give me a giraffe, put stars in the sky, boom, there they were. All of those things, boom, boom, boom. But when he created us, picture in my head is God gets down on his hands and knees. And he gets this dirt and he starts pushing this dirt together. And with his hands, he starts forming man, kind of like Play-Doh, but with dirt. I've done that. You ever made mud pies? All right. And so he's forming man out of the dirt. And then he does something to this dirt that you and I could never do. He goes, and he breathed life into this man. A miracle just in itself. But then later we read in verse 22, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man that he made, he, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. So this Man that he formed out of the dirt on the ground, it's not good that man should be alone. So he puts the man to sleep, anesthesia, anesthesia, the stuff that you use to knock you out. He, 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 he put him to sleep, and he reaches in and he takes out a rib. And he uses a rib and creates a woman. Now, there's a lot of things you could go with those things with the rib and the side and man and woman and all this. I'm not going there. But just the fact that God could create a woman from a rib, that's another miracle just in itself. There's a problem here. Man needs a woman. Boom, take a rib. It's fixed. That's another miracle. You see the miracles that were happening here? The way that God created the first man and woman just a miracle by itself. But here's what I want you to see. But in creating man and woman, Adam and Eve, he then told them something that we read and we talk about all the time. He said, now be fruitful and multiply. Go out and, 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 and multiply the earth. All people, since the creation of Adam and Eve, have come into this world by procreation. It's how it's been. <laughs> but then we read in Isaiah chapter 7, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And you'll call his name Emmanuel. You see, this virgin birth that was announced in Isaiah chapter 7 stands alone by itself because it's a special miracle. It is a sign that is there. You see, and here's what happens. A lot of people will believe that God created the world. Now, there's some people that don't believe all those things, evolution, the Big Bang, boom, all these things happen. But there's a lot of Christians and believers who will believe, oh, yes, I believe God created the world. In the beginning, God created. And we believe all of those things. But then when it comes to the virgin birth, they're like, well, I don't know about that because that's pretty difficult. That's a whole other story. I mean, nobody's ever done it before. Her, nobody's really done it after her. And so because it's never happened except for this one time, I don't know about this. And so they struggle with this. But throughout the Bible, we see that miracles are not a problem for God. As a matter of fact, God seems to, as you read your Bible, God seems to specialize in miracles. That's what he does. Everything he does is a miracle here. Gabriel, the archangel of God, he goes to Mary, and he told her that she would conceive and bear a son. Mary was not very old. Teenager, young teenager. But she was old enough to understand that there was a problem with this plan. What do you mean I'm going to bear a son? I haven't known a man. How am I going to bear a son? There's a problem here. I'm a virgin. This can't happen. Gabriel then answers Mary. And he says something that you and I need to remember when we struggle with our problems. God's a problem solver. And Gabriel says something back to Mary. And he says this in Luke chapter 1, verse 37. He says, for nothing will be impossible with God. You got a problem this morning? Nothing is impossible for God. But you don't know what my problem is. 
I know who my God is. You should be able to take your problem to God no matter what your problem is. No matter who it's with, what it is, what, what's going to happen, the results of it. It doesn't matter because God specializes in the impossible and he can fix these things and bring a miracle to your life. Whatever it is, we have to trust in God because as Gabriel said, nothing is impossible with God. See, there was a problem there. And God had a solution also because we read back in Genesis, the fall of man. Sin separated us from God. There's a problem there. God had a solution for this problem of sin. He would send a Savior that would be born to the Virgin Mary. The virgin birth says that God is big enough to solve all of our problems that we may have as well. Because God is a problem solver. Your problem is not too big for God. You have to remember that. The last thing I want you to see this morning is this. God is also the great peacemaker. He's the great peacemaker. As we read in Isaiah 7.14, this virgin-born child was to be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us. Man who had been separated from God by sin for all of these years. I can go to the temple. I can worship him there. He's in the temple. But now I'm going to send the Savior of the world who is going to be with you everywhere you are. No matter what goes on, he's going to be there with you. Through this virgin birth, we can now be united with God again. We can be united with him. This virgin-born Savior of the world would redeem mankind at the cross. And because of his death on this cross, the Savior that God sent... We can live. Luke 2 gives us the message of Christ's birth. In Luke 2, verse 14, the angels were talking, and the angels said this, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. Peace. The angels were talking about the Savior that has come. Remember, sin came into the world, separated us from God. Genesis 3.15, God promises that, hey, listen, one day the seed of the woman is going to come and crush this. Then later on we read in Isaiah, the virgin is going to conceive and bear a son. You're going to call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And then we get to us at Christmas here. Guess what? God is with us. And we're no longer separated by sin from him. He's there with us. God came to save us, and he did. He saved us here. We're, we're no longer separated by sin. Because of this virgin birth, we're united to him. This virgin-born Savior of the world would redeem mankind at the cross of Calvary. And because of his death, we can live. And now we have peace. As the angels proclaim, peace on earth through faith that we have of this virgin-born Savior. You see, Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace because we've been justified. Because of my faith, we accepted what Jesus did for us. The Savior who came, who died for us, who now rose again and lives in heaven, preparing a place for us. Because we know these things, we've accepted him, we've believed on him. We can have peace. Is everything going to be perfect tomorrow? I don't know, but I got peace. This peace can only ha we can only have 
when we fully surrender our lives to Jesus. How do I get this peace, Darren? Give your life to Jesus completely, fully, 100%. Paul tells the church in Philippi, in Philippians chapter 4, he said, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Don't worry about things. Give them to God, the problem solver. He made us a promise. He keeps his promises. And then verse 7, and when we do these things and we give all these things to God, let him solve our problems. He says, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. I can't explain to you how, how the peace that I have by knowing Christ. If you're a Christ follower, you understand that peace, but it's hard to explain that peace that we have. Because it's a peace that surpasses all understanding. And it says, this peace Darren, how do you go to these funerals of someone that you love and you know, and you're going to be separated them through, by, through, from them through death? How do you go there and, and you're not just torn apart? Because the peace of God guards my hearts and my mind in Christ Jesus. The peace of God protects me. It watches out for me. Am I sad? I'm not saying I'm not sad. Yes, I'm sad. But I have a peace. The peace that God gives. God, the great peacemaker, will once again bring peace over all the earth when Jesus returns to reign. We go back to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Another Christmas passage. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. He will perform what? He will provide peace. One day Jesus is coming back and we will have peace in the world. Because he's the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. He brings us peace because of his promises that he is fulfilling. Because of the problems that he solves for us. He gives us peace. Do you have that peace in your life today? The peace that only God can give. Would you come to Jesus this morning in faith? Surrender your life to him and find the peace that he offers to you. But Christians, as probably a majority of you are, won't you commit to sharing the good news of Jesus and the peace that he offers every day to someone? you commit to doing that? Sharing, I mean, listen, it's a Christmas season. We're, Jesus is coming. Why did Jesus come? Why are we celebrating this thing? Jesus is the reason for the season. What's the reason? This Jesus came to bring us peace. Salvation. We have to remember those things. And we need, as Christians, listen, we need to commit and say, I'm going to share this with those who need peace peace with those who need salvation. The miracle of the virgin birth tells us that God offers this peace to everyone. To everyone. We need to be sharing it 
And listen, if you don't have that peace, if you're not a believer, if you're not a Christian here this morning, listen, Jesus offers you peace. You just have to take it. Would you stand with me, head bowed, and eyes closed? This morning, if you're, if you're not a believer, if you're not a Christian here this morning, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Come to this altar. Ask Jesus into your heart. Ask him for that peace that only he can give. Now listen, do you have to come to this altar to do that? No, not necessarily. You don't. Coming to the altar is telling others what you're doing. But listen, becoming a believer, becoming a Christian, following Jesus is as simple as ABC. You have to admit, A, you have to admit that you're a sinner. You've done wrong. B, you have to believe in Jesus. Believe that he came, that he lived, that he died, that he rose again, that he came for you, that he offers you salvation. C, you need to confess your sins and ask forgiveness of your sins. It's as easy as ABC. If you're not a believer here this morning, I pray that you do that. That you ask Jesus to come into your heart, forgive you of your sins. And listen, if you do that this morning and you don't come to the altar, you just do that where you're standing at. Tell somebody. Tell somebody what you've done. Christian here this morning. Would you commit to sharing the peace of God with someone this Christmas season? Don't just get stuck with the gift giving and the decorating of your house and your tree and all the different stuff. Offer peace to someone. Would you commit to doing that? God, we thank you so much for who you are, for what you've done for us. God, I thank you for the word of God. That gives us the story of Jesus, of salvation, from the beginning to the end. God, I thank you for fulfilling your promises. For solving my problems and giving me peace. God, if there's someone here this morning that needs to come, I pray that they will do that this morning. As we sing a verse of invitation, if you need to come to the altar for salvation or just to commit yourself, I pray that you do that as we sing. Father God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for Christmas, this time of year when we can celebrate Jesus coming to earth. God, help for us to remember the reason for this season. Remember the peace that is offering. God, we thank you for the miracles that we can remember and study throughout the Bible. But God, even through the Christmas story, the, the, the the miracles that you've given us. God, for the virgin birth, 
I thank you for that promise. I thank you for solving that problem. And God, I thank you for the peace that comes from that. So God, help for us not to forget you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for being a part of this service. We, I appreciate you being here. Um, I, I enjoy Christmas time and, and Christmas season and this the messages that you kind of preach because it's Christmas time. And uh, a lot of times, you know, I, I know <laughs> you've all read the story of Christmas and Luke and Matthew and Isaiah and other places. You've read those stories. So I'm trying to come up with something a little new and different because I want it to be fresh for all of us. And uh, don't forget, listen, when you talk about Jesus is born of Mary, I mean, that is a miracle in itself. And we need to never forget that and what it means to us because of that and how it goes all the way back to Genesis, all the way to Revelation of that, that miracle of the virgin birth. So don't forget that. Again, thank you for being here. I hope you have a great afternoon. I hope your afternoon is as good as mine's going to be. And uh, um, come back tonight if you can, 6 o'clock. We'll have our service here tonight. Hope you can be here, be a part of that as well. Uh, before we go, Mr. Mike Chandler, would you dismiss us in prayer?